Welcome everybody to the seventh edition. This is the seventh edition of CSC Presents Tech Tuesdays. Um, welcome uh, everyone to this presentation and uh, I'm very, very proud to introduce my colleague and friend from Calgary, Alberta, Mr. Mark Francis. There he is. And uh, just a quick note, programming note. Uh, first of all, if you are watching today, you're welcome to join the chat. The chat is on your right hand side of the screen. And if you have friends that miss this or you want to share this or watch earlier editions of Tech Tuesday, like I said, this is the seventh. So there's a lot to consume already. Uh, just go to CSC TV. I've left a sticky note at the top of the chat. Uh, you're welcome to go and click that anytime. Subscribe if you like to, and you'll get the replay of this tomorrow. So without further ado, Mark, you are uh, you're in charge. Take it over. And thanks, everyone, for watching again. Thank you, James, and to everyone online for joining us today. We run every Tuesday, starting 15 minutes after market close, typically with three private companies at various stages from North America and abroad. Next week, being a first Tuesday of the month, look for our public company tech showcase with CSE listed companies. Our objective in running Tech Tuesdays is twofold. First, to help technology companies with increasing traction to gain relevant visibility. And second, to help capital markets players by interest, introducing interesting companies, focusing on whether the technology will have commercial traction and why, and also providing new knowledge of what is happening in innovation. For you as attendees, we do ask that you share ideas and your feedback with our presenters, including leads, possibly funding after due diligence, referral of someone with unique applicable expertise, or maybe even a potential strategic relationship. You can find their contact information in the chat board. With respect, we might refrain from giving management advice unless we are truly experts in the company's particular field. And don't treat our presenting companies as marketing targets for services, please. Some housekeeping matters. You will note a red reconnect tab at the top of your screen may appear if you lose audio. Just click it and you will be reconnected. In the event there are technical problems, we may hit the restart, in which case there is no action required by you, as the system will automatically reconnect everyone. We aim to run 45 minutes to one hour. The chat board may be utilized to ask serious questions, and please be clear as to whom your question is being addressed. Uh, we will try to get to them. Note our disclaimer. This presentation is for information only and is not a solicitation to make an investment in either shares or debt or to buy or sell stock. CSE and Mark Francis as session host, i.e. yours truly, make no representation about any of these companies. If you are interested in the investor pitch, please connect with the companies directly in order to get detailed information. Each company will have a seven minute presentation with their PowerPoint. When you see my face appear, the company has 15 seconds to wrap up. After all the companies have presented, we'll move to a panel discussion with Q&A this time moderated by, dare I say, a Habs fan, Simon Weintraub of Yigal Arnon. Today we have presenters, Brandon Bendis, CEO and co-founder of Woven Orthopedic Technologies of Manchester, Connecticut. We have Professor Avner Yayon, founder and CEO of Procore Biomed of Tel Aviv, and Claude Leduc, CEO of Orthoregenerative Technologies of Montreal, and another Habs fan who are taking over our show today. Let's actually start with Professor Yayon. Professor Avner Yayon has received his PhD and MD from the Hebrew University Madassa Medical School and had roles at Harvard Medical School and the Professor Weizmann Institute of Science. He was the founder of Procon, inventor of CNP for inherited dwarfism and advanced cartilage repair product, and in 2008 founded Procore Biomed. Delighted to have you with, with us, Avner, and uh, turn your video on as well, if you will, as your audio. Hello, everybody. I'm, uh, I should introduce Procore and our lead product, Eugenogel. And our mission is really to become the world leader in treatment of a very common disease, a degenerative joint disease and also arthritis. Uh, it afflicts more, than, afflicts more than 300 million people around the world. 
And Focor has taken a challenge to, to modify the way we treat uh, uh, osteoarthritis, which is currently been treated mainly by injections of hyaluronic acid, which is a viscous liquid, uh, in fact, a replacement therapy for, for, what, is, for what is happening in the joint uh, uh, naturally, making lots of hyaluronic acid. The problem is that hyaluronic acid in the joint gets degraded over time, and this is why you have problems with lubrication, degeneration, pain, and disability. So we've tackled this through a, a, a unique proprietary technology, we call it HaproLink, a technology whereby we link hyaluronic acid to any protein of choice. With my background, both in medicine, medicine and science, and over 30 years of experience in, in understanding the mechanism underlying human skeletal disorders and the way cartilage and bone grow, we have decided to, to uh, approach the, this problem by making a cost-effective injectable solution for osteoarthritis. And it's, it's based on, on the, uh, uh, so over, the, over these uh, last eight years, we've been able to, to conduct multiple clinical trials, including a double-blind control clinical study. And we've developed a comprehensive platform technology uh, based on five granted patents. We developed a medical device which is approved by the Israeli Ministry of Health. The product is Regenogel. We've launched it in Israel and we're selling in Israel. And our last achievement is that we've been meeting with Health Canada and got their approval to start a pivotal study with the designation as a class three medical device. And we're ready for clinical trials across Canada in Q1 2021. The, the, the problem with osteoarthritis is mainly in the hips and knees, but, but it, it covers, in fact, all the joints in the body. And the real issue is how one can develop something which is better than hyaluronic acid, which, as I mentioned, lasts quite shortly in the joint and, 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 and it does not provide long-term relief. So the trick is really to combine hyaluronic acid with another protein called fabinogen, which is a major plasma regulator of hemostasis and wound healing. And with this very unique conjugation of, two, of the, these two macromolecules, we create a viscoelastic gel, which in contrast to the viscous liquid, which is hyaluronic acid, remains in the joint for very long and provides strong support for, for motion. So what we get is really long-term pain relief Almost, in, almost immediately or very shortly after the injection, the, we, we are using only raw materials and very safe chemistry. And we, so we provide uh, a healing which is based on, on a gel and not a liquid, which acts not only as a lubricant, but also as a shock absorbing and a cushion to the joint, uh, allowing uh, spreading of the, of the, of the loads across the, the whole joint in, in a more even way. And most importantly, it is doing so by a single annual injection. The gel is so stable, it stays months and months in the joint, so it provides pain relief and, and, and uh, increased range of motion for many months, just as a single annual injection. Our next step is really to uh, go to outside of Israel, to North America. We've decided to start with Canada. First, following the pre-ITA meeting, we have now uh, in, contracted uh, a local CRO in Canada, and we're ready to go for the market in Canada. Thank you. Well, that's a world record time, Professor <laughs> Yayan. You did that uh, faster than, more efficiently than anyone we've had to date. Really? So thank you very much. <laughs> so now up, we will have Brandon Bendis. Brandon is a business executive who combines operating and transactional expertise to build and grow businesses and drives transactions that drive inorganic growth to position companies for eventual exit. His experience spans business life cycle stages and geographies around the world. Woven Orthopedics is his latest venture after having had five exits over the last 10 years, all in the medical space. Brandon, over to you. 
Okay, how am I coming through on this? We're hearing you. Okay. I don't seem to have a button anymore. Let's see. And we are good to go. Okay, so thank you very much for having me. Um, very quickly about me, Brandon Bendy is co-founder and president of Woven. And what we do at Woven Orthopedics is we design solutions that help surgeons tailor treatments to unique patient profiles. Um, the first technology we've come out with is the Augment Implant Enhancement System. And really what this is for, it, it's pretty basic from a orthopedic standpoint. And that is that in orthopedic surgery, surgeons rely heavily on plates and screws to treat patients. And the number one element that will influence outcomes and successful outcomes is achieving good fixation between screws, bone, and hardware. So today, um, there is a challenge that surgeons face, and that is getting good fixation, getting good stability between screw bo screws, bone, and hardware when you're dealing with compromised fixation scenarios. Um, surgeons today will use a variety of techniques in order to counteract and overcome those challenges. Um, they use bone cement in a lot of different countries. They use allograft packing. They might upsize their screw and plate constructs. They might use additional plates. Um, the good news is there's a lot of different techniques that they can use. The bad news is there are a lot of limitations to these. Um, for example, cement, uh, bottom left-hand corner of your screen, leakage risks, it's exothermic and could crack bones around it. It takes a while to prep. Um, overall, all these, all these different techniques, they're costly, they create additional risks, they're not always applicable. So um, this is kind of akin to the issue we see if you're trying to hang some sort of or mount some sort of furniture on your wall, right? If you can't get good fixation between screws in your wall, which is what this picture shows, you walk into a hardware store and you buy a wall out, right? Pretty simple. Um, well, unfortunately, uh, in orthopedics, the same challenge occurs in terms of getting fixation, but we move as humans, our bones are constantly moving, and bones also degrade. So we could use this type of a wall anchor, except none exists. So what we've created is this Augment Implant Enhancement System, which is a wall anchor for human bone. Uh, this happens quite often. Surgeons face this in, in a variety of instances. Um, in the home, wall anchors are included with almost every piece of furniture that you're going to buy, right? Humans, the challenge is worse. Um, lots of different scenarios impact the surgeon's ability to get good fixation. Parkinson's, osteoporosis, vitamin D deficiency, um, patients who take steroids or PPIs. So all of these impact the surgeon's capability to achieve good fixation. Our device helps them achieve that good fixation. And it applies across every single scenario where plates, screws, and bone come into contact with one another. Um, currently today, we're available in the United States under a 510K de novo clearance. We're available in Europe under the CE mark for spine use. Um, we've had some very good results over the first year of use. Um, our European sales, as you can see here in year one, year one was last year in 2019. Um, we had very strong adoption. That was really um, based on five different types of of strengths that we have. One is, is the technology works. Um, it's a great technology. It's simple, three steps to implant this thing. There is no change to a surgeon's approach. They use the exact same tools that they've always used before in order to do this. So far the data, 100% success, zero device related complications. We've implanted over 750 individual implants into, into our subjects and not one complication thus far. Uh, there's an immediate economic benefit this is up to and can be 77% less expensive than some of these alternative techniques. That's what we're seeing out of Europe. Um, and overall, we've had a controlled market release. We're doing this slowly. We want to make sure we get the right type of, of scenarios and right type of patient profiles to use this with. Um, we learn every day, right? Every surgery is different. So that's what's helped so far. The technology itself is unique in three ways. Um, the first is you can see over here on the left-hand side, in the short term, we distribute stress, we distribute load so that there are no high stress zones, and that's what's cr that what that is what creates some of these complications that surgeons see with um, with fixation is there's overload on bone, so bone will resorb 
it will destroy, it will disintegrate. Um, our device prevents that from happening. And then the second piece um, is that we really enable bony ingrowth so that over time, good healing can occur. You can see the mechanisms of action here. Um, overall, our data has been fantastic. As I mentioned, over 750 implanted, zero complications. What we do in the strength of our technology, we restore fixation scenarios to that that equates to the ideal fixation. So if you take a patient with horrendous bone quality that you have absolute pull out and a screw doesn't fit at all, you can just, the surgeon can go in and pull a screw out with their bare hands. We will restore that fixation with our device. Same screw, same hole, restore it to the ideal level of fixation using our Augment device. We've shown it in human testing. We've shown it in commercial use. We've shown it in animal and preclinical testing, and it's all worked out very, very well. Overall, extremely simple to use. You can see here, um, cutting to size, placing it on an inserter, and placing it into bone. This is a simple device that can be used in under two minutes. Uh, our team has done this a number of times. It was mentioned before, myself, I've had five exits in the last 10 years. Um, all of us hail from some of the larger device companies um, in executive leadership positions. Um, I myself have sold businesses to four of the businesses that are listed on here, but our team comes from a number of different places. You can see some of our team members here. Um, in case you were interested, you can learn a little bit more about us uh, by visiting our website at www.wovenorthopedics.com. Um, but overall, that's really it. Uh, this is a massive market um, where we'd apply to a number of different scenarios and therefore surgeons across the world in rural and in urban environments can use us for a fraction of the cost of other techniques. Um, it's simple. It has great initial results. We're available in both the United States and the European Union. We will be expanding into other geographies shortly over the next couple of years. Um, and we have phenomenal first year results that uh, prove what's going on commercially. So thank you very much. Um, that's it about us. Excellent. Thank you, Brandon. Everybody is right on time today. Our last presenter, Mr. Claude Leduc, also a Habs fan. Mr. Leduc's career with private and Fortune 500 medical device and biopharma companies includes 22 years in the musculoskeletal market in senior roles with Genzyme, Biomatrix, Serono, and Biosyntech. As CEO with Biosyntech, he raised more than $50 million in public and private financings and was directly involved in the clinical and regulatory development of the BST Cargel project product, which was later acquired by the orthopedic giant Smith & Nephew. Claude, yours. Yes, thank you very much, Mark. Um, so, yes, so I just want to um, introduce Ortho Regenerative Technologies. So we are a orthobiologic company um, that is specialized in soft tissue repair. And I will describe that in a second, but I'll give you a, a quick snapshot of the company. So we were incorporated in 2015. We're a spin-off of uh, Polytechnic Montreal which was the same um, group at Polytechnic that uh, developed the first generation product that was sold to uh, Smith & Nephew. Product is called BST Car Gel. It's marketed in 40 countries in the world. Um, we are a public company uh, traded on the CST under or ORTH. Um, we raised so far about uh, 8 million uh, Canadian. We just, um, we need to add, of course, the latest closing that we did last Friday, 2.5 million. Uh, shares are controlled mainly by founders, university, and management. Uh, but um, you know, uh, now we have a bit more float with the latest uh, raise that we did. So basically, what we have, the technology is a mucoadhesive chitosan-based biopolymer matrix. Um, Makatosan is a polymer that we extract from shrimp shells, and it has this um, this um, uh, quality, if you want, that to be a positively charged uh, molecule, which is mucoadhesive to negatively charge soft tissues. So it becomes a wonder um, vehicle, if you want, to deliver um, orthobiologics, which is, for example, an example, what we do is using platelet-rich plasma. Uh, for to augment um, soft tissue uh, uh, conditions, uh, such as, for example, meniscus or rotator cuff or ligament tears. 
and um, and I'll describe you uh, in the coming slide how it works. Uh, the product is called Ortho R, and uh, and I will describe that more in a, in a second. Um, the market itself for soft tissue repair is huge, $5 billion market. So just for example, in the US, 600,000 uh, annual surgeries for rotator cuff tears of the shoulder. Uh, meniscus, 1.2 billion, cartilage, 1.2 billion uh, um, uh, surgeries per year. So it's a huge market. So what is the clinical need uh, into that market? Here we have it in yellow in, into that pie. In yellow, it's the failure rate for each one of those three conditions. So up to you know, more than 50% failure for rotator cuff, meniscus uh, you know, up to 40% and cartilage up to 45% of failure rate with standard of care surgery. So orthopedic surgeons are annoyed by that. If, uh, evidently, of course, patients are annoyed to the ones that are part, of course, of the failure. So there is a strong need, of course, for better treatment or to improve standard of care surgery. And this is where, where, where we come in with our technology. So first, I just want to describe what is platelet-rich plasma. Platelet-rich plasma is a an autologous um, um, fraction of the blood. So it's very easy to prepare. All the orthopedic uh, surgery uh, theater have uh, centrifuges uh, to prepare PRP. So basically, you just collect about 60 cc of uh, the patient's blood. You spin it between 8 to 12 minutes. And then it separates the uh, your whole blood in different layers, different type of cells. And so we take only the middle fraction, which is the PRP fraction. And that platelet-rich plasma is very uh, rich in granules, which are secreted by the platelets. And the, those granules, they secrete growth factors and multiple proteins involved into the cascade of tissue regeneration. So that's the autologous um, uh, component or autobiologic that we use. And now the, um, the implant itself or the, the polymer itself, it's a proprietary cytosan formula, which is combined with the PRP. It is lyophilized, so it has a shelf life of two years, very practical market-wise because uh, hospitals can uh, store it, of course, for a long time. Uh, our, our lyophilized or dry powder is solubilized with autologous PRP, which is very practical and very easy to prepare. It adds only six to eight minutes to surgery time. And again, it's mucoadhesive to soft tissues. So you want to have those growth factors from PRP in situ. You want it to stay there. So the mucoadhesiveness of the polymer is helping to keep the growth factors right where you want them to work. Um, and the combination that we call the implant is uh, coagulated uh, rapidly, a very, uh, you know, between about uh, six to eight minutes. And it increased resistance time. If you inject PRP alone without the polymer, it will, the resistance time will be in less than 24 hours. And with the combination, it, it is uh, increasing resistance time for more than six weeks. Basically, again, chitosan molecule on your left, the dry powder, we retrieve blood, we separate the blood, and then we just inject the PRP fraction into our vial. Then you shake for 20 seconds. Then after the surgery is, is completed, the surgeon just um, you know, um, uh, delivered the uh, implant on top of the uh, surgery. So surgery, for example, for the, the rotator cuff tendon, you will have anchorage, and then you will have uh, sutures, and then you just uh, deposit your implant on top or on, uh, under or in the surrounding tissues so that your growth factors will work in the coming weeks to uh, increase uh, and augment the regeneration of new tissue. We did a proof of concepts, of course, in animals. So sheep uh, and, and goats are the large animals that are mostly used in orthopedic uh, preclinical uh, trials. So here, just to, to show you that in, pre, in a normal tendon, you can see the organization of the cells and their bundle and the, uh, the type of cells or the, um, the shape of cells. With, if you just do uh, uh, the standard of care surgery, you have a fibrous tissue. So a fibrous tissue will not have the same mechanical and magical property as a normal tissue. That's, for, that's most certainly why there is uh, so many failures in order to take off repair. And when you combine uh, the standard of care surgery with our technology and PRP, you can see that the type of tissue that is regenerated is very alike normal uh, tissue. Uh, normal tendon, if you want, and same t same thing here in in histology. A normal tendon, you know, will have a lot of uh, reddish uh, zones here, which reflects the glycosaminoglycan content. 
glucose and logalkins are macromolecules that are very important into the so physiology of soft tissue. Into the scourish tissue from standard of care surgery, you don't have much red, and it is more a scourish tissue organization. And with the new, uh, the combination product plus standard of care surgery, you can see again a lot of those glucose and logalkins that are present, reflecting a tissue that is more valuable than standard of care surgery. Regulatory wise, um, we are classified as a device slash drug slash biologic combination product. The device part is the, the syringes and, uh, and other uh, pins that we provide you know, with the kit. The polymer itself is classified as a drug because it enhances the uh, biologic components from the PRP. So that designation is fresh from two weeks from the FDA. And so it gives us a lot of labeling into our product whenever we launch it into the market. Um, we are preparing a US clinical trial, which will be a phase one, two. And the ID submission, uh, it should be the IND submission. I, um, I made uh, a mistake here. I did not correct it after designation, but it's IND submission that is planned for all this October. Uh, and then we'll do um, phase three uh, studies uh, you know, after the phase one and two. Um, I'll just show you quickly the protocol. I, we're yes. a little over. Can you oh, just... Okay, yes, okay. it goes fast. I let oh, you okay. have an extra minute actually so far. So. All right, all right. I apologize for that. So just yes. to let you know that we start a clinical trial in the US and I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Very good. Excellent, Claude. Now we will bring back all of our panelists for the Inquisition. And we are really pleased that our guest moderator today is Simon Weintraub of Yigal Arnon at <clears throat> Tel Aviv, a large Israeli law firm with heavy technology expertise. Simon runs YTech Runway for tech companies, and he sorely misses hockey at the forum. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Simon, if we, good to see you again, Simon. And uh, if we can bring Brandon back as well. And then I'll turn it over to you, Simon. Thank you. Great. Well, yeah, why don't you just start, Simon? Okay. Um, all right, thank you, Mark. First of all, I really appreciate being invited. Um, although I would love to do this in person, um, I definitely think it saves on a lot of travel time based, uh, as, as I'm based in Tel Aviv, it's certainly a lot easier to do this from the comfort of my home in the evening. Um, Anyways, I think this could be a really interesting discussion just because, I mean, by the way, by way of my background, I'm an attorney. Um, I specialize in venture capital and, um, and, and startups. I work a lot with medical device companies. So it's interesting to have this discussion with medical, com med medical device companies in the same field from around the world. Um, and I'd love to get your thoughts on a few different issues. Um, the first question I wanted to ask is actually about your experiences with the big players the big, you know, large international medical device companies. Now, obviously you don't need to name names on your, you know, the specifics, you know, that, that you've had with which, which companies, um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, you know, how, you know, how early can you, you know, can you or should you get involved with the large medical device companies? Um, does it make sense to look at them as potential investors, um, potential investors slash, you know, um, uh, business collaborations? Should you try to separate that? Very interested to hear uh, your thoughts and your experiences uh, about timing and about how to interact with the large uh, medical device companies. So um, maybe we'll just kind of go around. Uh, perhaps uh, Avner, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, we, uh, we uh, first of all, we are really uh, um, in, in this field, there's, there's a, uh, many of the of the large companies are, are in this field. The, almost uh, every large company in the orthopedic uh, arena has a, some kind of an HA product. Uh, so all of them have a visco supplement. So in in a way, we uh, we feel as uh, uh, on one hand uh, great competition, but on the other hand a lot of opportunity also. And we have we of course had some contacts with some of our uh, potential competitors and, and offering them as a next generation product. Uh, we see a lot of interest. We, we feel though that uh, it is still a stage for us and we have to take one step further in order to, uh, to uh, get more valuable uh, discussions with these, with these companies. 
Okay, thank you. And 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 Claude, what about you? What what is what is your experience been? Yes, so we're talking already to uh, automotive companies. We want to be known, you know, in uh, with our technology, with a new market. Uh, you know, into the um, soft tissue repair field uh, for for this type of technology. And so all of the big orthopedic companies have a PRP device uh, to prepare the PRP into the OR. So what we are doing is that we are uh, teaming up with one of the big ones for our clinical trials. We will we want to use the same uh, PRP uh, system in all clinical centers. So we harmonize all those uh, uh, PRP uh, device uh, so that there is no interference between the te different technologies, if you want. So we are uh, working hard uh, right now and uh, you know, with one of the big ones. And uh, so certainly um, that relationship you know, will help. And we still don't um, uh, discard uh, partnering with the others because our technology can fit with any of the PRP devices. It's just that for the, the sake of the clinical trial, we are partnering with one of them for just to, um, to make sure that uh, you know, we have the best system uh, in hand for the clinical trial. So again, uh, we have discussions and, uh, and traction, voila. Okay, thank you. Um, and Brandon, I'm gonna ask you the same question, but if I, if I remember quick, you know, uh, correctly from your bio, I, I think you came, you know, some of your background is from this world, from, from large medical device companies. So maybe when I ask you, it'd be interesting, interesting to hear you to put on the hat from the other side and, and perhaps, and tell us a little bit about, you know, how it looks like from the, you know, from the, the big company standpoint. Sure. So um, just to clarify, I, I personally have not worked at the big companies. Uh, my team has. A lot of the people on my team have done that and have come from the industry side. I myself have always had them as clients and or sold or exited businesses to them. So I don't have the expertise from their specific side. Um, that being said, I can answer from from kind of the same perspective as as. Um, you asked earlier, which is, you know, there's a time and a place in which discussions with some of these major suppliers makes a lot of sense. Um, and the time and a place depends on what your absolute goals are as a business, right? So having relationships with these larger suppliers can be extremely beneficial when you are at a stage that um, there are sales opportunities there, when you're at a stage where there's funding opportunities there. I personally, I don't typically approach these companies for earlier stage funding. Um, we tend to stay away from that with our businesses because there's an end goal there um, that may not necessarily be aligned with what the ultimate end goal is. And there's a value proposition there that you have to reach. So in my opinion, um, for me and, and, and the experience I've had so far is I'll approach some of these, some of these companies later on so that we have a fully functioning product that can bring value and can fall nicely into the set of, or the suite of products that some of these larger companies have so that they can see the value of why they should start paying attention. Um, but there's two different, it's two different avenues, right? You could do it from the development side or from the commercial side. We tend to stick with more of the commercial side. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Brandon, that's a very, that was very insightful. Um, maybe I'll, I'll change the direction a little bit. I want to talk a little bit with you about, you know, what it is to, to build a global company today. Um, and obviously, this is something that you should be thinking about from the earliest stages. Um, and, you know, what is your what, what is your global strategy today? I, I guess, you know, even to get a little bit political, I mean, can you really look to attack the whole world today from a from a global sales perspective? When I say the whole world, can you simultaneously try to, you know, take on the Asian markets and the North American markets. How does that work today? Um, maybe, maybe Claude, we'll start with you if you've given some, some thought to some of these, these challenging issues. Sure. Um, you know, I, in my career, you know, I launched a product uh, as a company and then, uh, you know, set uh, distributors and, you know, it's a long path if you do that when you have a technology that should be launched globally. And um, so that's the, that is the longest path to maximize um, the value of your product. In, in our case, we want to have a, a global deal with a major orthopedic company or multiple deals deal with different global companies so that they can launch, they have already the financial and human resources, of course, or capacity 
to launch uh, our technology globally. So that's uh, what we want to do. We don't want to start on our own. Uh, again, because uh, it's you know it's too expensive and too long, and you lose time into the race to the market. Okay, thank you, um, Avner. Um, how do how do you view the uh, challenge of, of building a global company coming out of Israel? Okay, uh, first, Israel is a very small country, and this is why uh, I think most most uh, Israeli companies, or especially small companies. Uh, go quite quickly outside of Israel, and, and there's a lot of experience in building an international organization uh, quite early in, in, this, in the in the life of a company. But specifically for our product, I want to. I think it's a unique case here because we depend. A lot, it depends a lot on the on the culture of the of the territories. I can say that, for example, the way people treat. Uh, these joint diseases in in, in 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 Japan, for example, or in or in the U.S. or, or in Europe, are very very different. In uh, uh, because it depends. On, uh, I can say, for example, in Japan, they tend to to do eight to twelve injections per year. I mean, for them, it's it's like a routine um, uh, visits to to the to the to the, uh, to the doctor. It's part of the of the relationship of the of the orthopedic surgeon with with his patients. And they don't. They're not. And on the other hand, in, in the U.S., it's completely the other way around. Uh, the 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 way is to try and avoid and, and make as as fewer injections as possible. So the race is really who can move from three or five injections to one single injection per year. Um, so so the and we have and we have actually accommodated uh, this this different uh, these different cultures in discussions with. Uh, with the Japanese companies, for example, we tend to provide a product that uh, not only is based, by the way, on 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 their own uh, local uh, uh, because we're dealing with plasma with plasma derived products. For example, pavinogen is a plasma derived component. Uh, then it's very sensitive to use the local supply of of pavinogen from from local blood banks or from local uh, 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 manufacturers. So, so there's a lot of issues which make this this product, um, on one hand, interesting and 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 some, so and somehow uh, tailor made to different territories. Although most, I would say, in 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 the US and Europe, it's and in Canada, uh, it will it it's quite similar. But but it's a challenge also to to approach all these different territories, uh, becoming a, a global um, supplier of this product. Okay, thank you, Avner. Um, and then I, I guess Brandon, I'm asking you the same question, but maybe perhaps if you can focus a little. I think one, you know, one one issue that I mentioned, I don't think we've really touched upon it yet, is really, you know, and I don't know if you've thought about it in your current company. You know, can you build a, a sales plan, let's say for China, or raise money in China, simultaneously try to go for the U.S. markets? I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts. So, so you're, you're the question, which is an interesting one, right? And it's the dichotomy of running a business in general is, um, is, is the, the desire to be global. Um, I would go into every single country all at once if I could, right? Um, if I could being the key, the key three words there is it comes down to two things, right? It comes down to personnel and it comes down to financial means and funding. If you have the ability, if you have the team who can do it, and the monetary resources to be able to go into it, then as a medical business, it makes sense because for all of us, there's a regulatory pathway. And if you can start, there, there, is, a, there is a process for how products get to market. And each country typically has their own process. So if you can begin the process at the same time in all countries, then by all means, that's a great position to be in. Most of us don't have the financial resources or the personnel resources to be able to do that. So then it comes down to value and what your what your end goal is. So for a company like ours, right, and we are attacking specifically first, we're attacking the trauma and the spine markets. For us to show um, our device for an eventual either exit event um, or an eventual IPO, we need to hit the largest markets first, right? And that comes down to for us and the and the the cost of our technology and where it's used and how it's used. The two most uh, the two largest markets for us are the European Union and the United States. Um, for others, 
China could be the biggest market. For others, India could be the biggest market. For others, Brazil might be that biggest market, right? Um, so the, the key there is focus, is where can we deploy our resources? Where can we get through the regulatory, the commercial elements, and actually make something happen with the small team that we have? We've chosen to do it by going into Europe and the United States based on our end goal. But by all means, each market has a very, very specific value proposition that it could provide for a company in building the value you're seeking to do, whether you're trying to IPO or eventually exit your business. Great. Thank you very much for that, Brandon. Um, I think for my next question, I want to take it into a, a different direction and actually want to talk about um, the greatest resource that each of you has in your companies, which is actually your, hu your human resources. Um, I'm curious to know, what is your, what is your corporate culture? Um, how do you recruit today talent from outside? And I would say, even more importantly, how do you retain the the, the great talent that you have? And I, I say this especially today, um, which you see you know, across all businesses, the you know the the difficulties in you know in 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 maintaining young talent that is you know interested in looking for the next adventure and the next opportunity. Um, and it'd be really interesting to see how each of you have thought about this and, and, and how you build your, your business from a, from a human resource perspective. And maybe, maybe Avner, we'll, we'll start with you. Well, uh, this is really a, a big challenge. To, uh, to, uh, but uh, in, in our case, we are, in, in, quite in contrast to the previous com company I founded, which was quite, I mean, not very large, but, but certainly larger. We are a small company, less than 10 people right now. And, and it's, it's, it runs more like a, like a family business. We are very, I mean, the people um, go with me for many years. I mean, some of the people are around 20 years working with me in, di in different projects, different companies. So they, they kind of follow. Um, we are really a, a very scientifically based company. There's a lot of um, uh, kind of rational design. There's a lot of scientific discussions. It's all based on on science, and and I think this is why uh, people uh, love what they're doing, and this is also what attracts people to come to our company. Not not always. Uh, it's it's so that I think it's quite unique in that also in the Israeli uh, um, um, environment. Um, and 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 many people actually would like to do sometimes their first job and at at uh, Procore like they did before that in Procon, uh, because somehow uh, uh, we got famous for for training people very well, and they know they if they come to, to our company they get excellent training, and then it's a, it's an excellent place to move forward to to you know to other uh, opportunities, and so so in in a way we got lucky to be. Uh, uh, to to be able to to uh, recruit good people uh, based on reputation rather than you know even economical success. So it's uh, this is how we 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 operate. Great, thank you, Abner. Um, Brandon, what what about you? What what is the what is the HR strategy at your company? So this is you know unique to a and very similar to what was just said, unique to a smaller business, right? When you're growing a business and you're trying to build a business, um, when you're not at thousands of different employees, uh, our strategy or, or the one that I've tried to implement at all of our businesses is twofold. The first thing is we look for our core team members, which there are very few, right? So you have a few core team members who are full-time, entirely dedicated, who can, who are jacks of all trades, who are self-starters and scrappy individuals who know how to build things with their own hands. And that is, we look for people who have created their own businesses, who have taken risks. I actually love seeing someone who built a business and had it fail, um, as terrible as that might seem. Um, I like to see that those people took risks. They understand what it takes to build something because especially in a COVID environment, right? And for those of us who, who may even have children in the COVID environment, that you are working around the clock, you are working weekends, there are no off hours anymore, right? So you want someone who's dedicated to that, who gets it, who's scrappy. That's, that's step one. And then step two is our entire economy is changing and COVID's really going to push us in this direction too, which is specialists and part-time specialists, these contractors who can work in a very specific setting because as we all know, medical companies have specific areas of expertise that may not require a full-time person, 
but have a very specific skill set that's necessary. For example, regulatory, right? You're not always su always submitting regulatory packages to get approvals, but when you do, there might be a two, three month period where you need someone who knows exactly what they're doing in that capacity. So we typically, our HR is we will create a core team. Um, the core team will consist of a number of individuals who are jacks of all trades, who, who are willing to do a lot of the scrappy work. And then we'll go hire individual contractors that have very specialized set of skills. And, and similarly to what was, what was just said is you, you wind up working with a lot of the same people because once you find the people you trust, they, you bring them along to the different companies. But that's typically who we look for when we build our teams. Great, thank you. Thank you, Brandon, for, for sharing that. Um, I assume, I, I hope I have time maybe for one more question. Um, so maybe one, um, one issue that we haven't spoken about yet is, is fundraising. Um, I would be curious to know about, you know, what kind of alternative um, avenues you've explored in, in fundraising. And, and I say this particularly in the, you know, in the industry that you're in and as you know, in invasive medical device companies where, you know, it's, it's typically a long period to market, um, a long period to build the company. It's not, a, it's not an app that, uh, you know, a VC can just invest in, you know, and hopefully turn around within two, three years. Um, so, um, Maybe maybe Claude, we'll, we'll we'll start with you. I'd, I'd be interested to hear about your experiences in, in the in the fundraising world. Absolutely. Um, so, in, in this uh, actual company or to RTI, um, you know, we have the benefit to have a founder uh, of the company that is uh, CEO of a pharma company. So that, uh, you know, he created Ortho RTI, you know, as a sister company. And so, you know, that helps us, of course, uh, into the uh, setting of, uh, of Ortho. We are very, very uh, smart, uh, low um, uh, red tape company. So, so you know, f um, the, the burn rate is very low because we don't have uh, many people working full time as branded, uh, a bit the uh, same model as branded. So, so we are raising the money that we need. So we are, you know, since a year, for example, we did four raises. Uh, three of them were on debentures. So debentures were less dilutive at the, at the time. And we felt that it was the best vehicle at the time. So we raised about, uh, roughly about a million or so uh, each, each time. And then, you know, all that money is going directly into the programs. And then, so you, you can uh, achieve milestones with each one of those raises. And we have a network of friends of the companies um, and, and um, you know, long-time shareholders and um, that we bring in. And so that's what helped us to instantly uh, being able to raise money every quarter uh, to, to advance uh, our, our programs. Recently, last Friday, we closed 2.5 million into an equity raise. And again, uh, you know, management founders, uh, you know, chipped uh, again into the, the pot, of course, but uh, we got again, the uh, valuable uh, long-time shareholders that still came in plus new ones that came in. And so we, we have that capacity to raise as needed, but next time is, is going to be a big one. You know, we'll, we'll raise more money in the coming uh, year because, um, you know, we are starting a US clinical trial in 10 centers. We're going to spend $5 million in the next uh, few years. So that will be a bigger raise. So we are going to list ourselves into a cross-listing uh, listing in the US. And, and we're going to do a Canadian uh, US uh, raise with uh, some institutional, but also some uh, retail side uh, uh, raise if you want. So that's how we proceed. And, um, and it worked uh, so far very well. Great, Claude, thank you for sharing your experiences and, and your, your plans as well. Um, Avner, uh, how about you? Um, what, what are your views and, and how's it been for, for you to, to raise money for your company? Well, I think we are probably at the more uh, earlier stage. We are currently in the middle of of uh, of. Uh, I I I they uh, following uh, my, the the sale of my previous company. I have um, for different reasons we won't elaborate much. I've decided to uh, to actually um, personally invest in the company. I strongly believe in the technology. And I, I wanted to be, in, in this case, uh, more independent than, than previously. 
for different reasons. And, I, and, and therefore, it's actually only now, after about almost $8 million invested, uh, we, we also were very lucky with the, with the European grants. There's quite large European grants for, for the industry. And we were part of three different consortia. And we got $7 million as, as, as funding from, from uh, non-diluted funding from, from, uh, from these uh, grants. Uh, and we're now in the midst of, of a pre-IPO uh, uh, round, in fact, that uh, this is going pretty well. And so we hope to be uh, also listed um, by either the end of this year or probably the first uh, quarter of next year. This is our, this is our strategy. So we have no no VC money so far. Quite quite unique, I think. In the, in the <laughs> uh, no, no, thank you for sharing that. And first of all, there's no question that you know the receipt of the EU grants is a great example of of utilizing um, you know alternative financing. So thank you. Um, and I guess Brandon, lastly, you know you would be, be um, interested to hear what you have done and 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 kind of you know. What you what you view as your um, you know as your as your road and your path forward? It's look, it's tough, right? Uh, Claude and Avner just highlighted two very different types of strategies because it's it's hard, right? Capital raising and fundraising is a full time job essentially, um, and there's no easy way about it. What's been interesting is I've at least noticed over the last 10 to 15 years that the industry has changed in terms of who the most likely funding partners are. Um, there used to be more of a heavy reliance on funds, and now we're moving more towards family offices and private individuals. Perhaps that's because of the way that things are moving electronically, right? But that's what I've seen from a, from an, a, a large scale perspective. What, what we do really depends on the company we're running. Um, and how much capital we need, right? If we were doing a clinical trial where you need a lot more money, um, you know, I, I think Claude, was it you or Abner that said you're doing a 10 site trial, right? And it, that's a lot of money, right? So you need a different type of funding partner all at once to bring that in. Uh, but what we do, in fact, we're in the middle of a raise right now, actually. Uh, we started a raise about a month ago um, to raise an $18 million B round to commercialize our technology. But so far, you know, we've closed half of it. Uh, with family offices. I would expect the rest of it is probably going to be the same. Um, we'll have a second closing probably um, earlier next year slash later this year This year, in order to finalize the offering. Um, but it's it typically comes down to what, again, what your ultimate goal is, right? If, if you start bringing in institutions, you're going to be looking at tighter timelines, but a bigger ticket size, Right. So if you need a lot of money, but you're looking at a quicker exit or a quicker return scenario, that might be appropriate for somebody. Right. A family office might have a longer term horizon, uh, longer term time horizon. And but it'll be a smaller ticket size typically. Right. And then your individuals, your, your high net worths are going to be even smaller than that. And then your um, your corporate strategic venture arms are going to be kind of somewhere in the middle of everything. So it's a t it's a tough world. Um, but it depends on where you're going and, and we're seeing it evolving towards more of a um, more of a scattered type of scenario where all the power used to be in the hands of, of venture capital funds um, and private equity funds. And it's changing big time. Um, and these are for the for the earlier stage businesses. Right. As soon as you start talking about um, 50, 100 million dollar raises, you can start talking about IPOs and start going to the public markets. Uh, but this is really for the smaller amounts. Great, thank you very much. I see Mark popping on. I, my, I have a feeling we're getting close to the end of our time. We, we, I let you run over a little because this has been a fabulous, fabulous session. Precise answers, excellent questions. Um, I neglected to mention something uh, early on. Uh, it's the nominators and how we got these companies. So we, uh, uh, we have uh, Avner Yayon uh, because of the referral of Beyond Ventures, so Procore, thanks to Beyond Ventures. We have Brandon Bendis and Woven Orthopedic uh, because I first met Brandon and heard him present at Koretsu Forum. And uh, Claude Leduc and Ortho Regenerative comes from Canadian Securities Exchange itself. So uh, delighted to have an excellent conversation. Thank you to our presenters, Avner Yayon, Brandon Bendis, and Claude Leduc, and our moderator, Simon Weintraub of Yigal Arnon, uh, thank you for your time and, and your preparation. Uh, you made this a great conversation. 
Uh, special thanks to our two from Tel Aviv, by the way, for working late at night to join us. And thank you to our attendees for your time today. Go to the company websites and learn more about these companies. If you have a lead for them, do connect. And now let's have James Black, our VP of CSE, give his closing remarks. Uh, well, everyone, thanks again. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we are over time. So uh, again, if you're watching or you participated today and you want to watch the replay, uh, it goes up tomorrow to see it on CSE TV. Best way to do that is to subscribe. So just go to YouTube. I put the link above on the uh, top right there. Subscribe. It'll come into uh, your channel and uh, you can watch yourself again. Or if you were participating today or want to share, send your friends. Uh, that's it from us from the CSE. We're back next week with the Public Company Showcase. Uh, it's going to be related to the automotive sector and all the interesting stuff that's uh, evolving that industry. So please join us then. And uh, thanks again, Mark, for hosting another great Tech Tuesday. Uh, this is James. I'm signing off. Thanks again. On behalf of CSE, we'll see you at the next one.